Hello and welcome to Hammer and Dice. Today we are going to look at Old School and Cool, an OSR zine by Night Owl Publishing. As we can see, it's made for Zine Quest and has 39 pages of content uh, featuring OSR feats, spells, and then lots of different options. So if we just jump right in, we start with the Augur class uh, for OSR uh, type games. This class looks into the future using birds and is non-magical but has some kind of magical type abilities and can in fact has some things that are quite unique for uh, OSR classes in that it gets to look at the DM's notes, being able to see the future and do other things such as chant a traditional song once per day and you roll a d10 so we'll just have a look at what on today's ritual we would get uh, act as a wish spell it is temporary for 2d12 hours, but there is a 1% chance it will become permanent at the spell's end. So that's quite a, quite a powerful ability to have there, but it is a 1 in 10 chance to get that. The other things include acting as a blessed spell, acting as charm person, or plus 1 to roll to everyone in the party for the next 24 hours. Um, and then it advances on to uh, being able to perform, perform a ritual once per game year. It takes 60 seconds to look over the referee's notes or books in-game insight into any hidden treasures or magical items, choose the result of any three consecutive dice rolls by any person, study the map of the location if there is a map for 60 seconds. So it's some pretty powerful stuff but limited by once per game year. The Berserker. This class is a comedy take on the Berserker and is mainly for uh, uh, urban environments. They can go into a drunken rage that gives them bonuses to uh, attacking enemies that are weaker than them as their natural bullies. They can drink a litre of liquid in three seconds, so that's impressive in and of itself. And at a high level can summon a drunken mob, go on a bar crawl I suppose, and get into all kinds of situations with that. The Monflare, which is a take on the kind of the happy drunk monk brewer archetype as you can see here. Ninth level of this class is called the Friar Tuck. So this is a comedy based class. They can't be reduced below one HP. If they are, they pass out and collapse, but they can be revived by a liter of fine wine. They can create one liter of wine per 24 hours and can win people over with their charms and smile. If they don't manage to, then they lose a temper and get angry because of it. So that's a fun alternative take on a cleric. So the Heliotha is a race class based on a creature, the idea of a creature made of solely of light. Due to that, they get bonuses and negatives. So starting with the negatives, they can only be healed by light spells and are weak to darkness. But in the positive, they can go and be invisible in bright situations. They can cause plants to super grow and at higher levels, bend light around the form to gain visibility. So that's an interesting uh, addition there. The language Expert is pretty much what it says on the tin, a class that focuses around the idea of being able to communicate with different creatures, being able to read languages, and taking that to its kind of ex the extreme of being able to read um, magical scrolls and then eventually cast magical scrolls without being a direct magic user. And reaching ninth level, they can establish a school and get 3d6 first level language expert followers who have come to learn and are loyal to them due to their expertise at speaking these languages. This is a bit more of a utility class, but would be a good addition to any group that isn't going the full murder hobo route. The Lizardling, I'm sure it's a reference to something I'm just not quite picking up, is a take on Dragonborn. They have a bite attack, natural armor due to their tough skin, various attacks around their teeth, their tail, and on death they melt into a pool of acid. Lycan's Bane, this class is a very interesting actually, in that it starts off most powerful at the level 1, with 5 of these abilities here, lose 1 each level as your character comes to realize how crazy it is to go and attack werewolves, but as they then pass the 6th level as Van Helsing, they can combine their new Van experience with their skills and they start to gain them back once per level. I do think this having Lycan's Bane 7th, 8th and 9th, they could have had some more interesting names for those there, but otherwise that's a very fun, I think it's a very fun class to have. Puppeteer, this class uses magic to put on puppet shows and can influence the audience through them, but they also, those puppets that they have, can animate and give them extra abilities based on what kind of puppet they have, so marionettes can open locks, 
and find remove traps, shadow puppets of expert at hiding, hand puppets can pick pockets, and rod puppets can climb and have ex do extra damage. So they can create these puppets on the fly and can improve their abilities as they level up. So the shop, this is a bard-like class, I'm sure I've mispronounced that. An actual or orators um, go travel around and talking to different people, improving the party's reputation and controlling the flow of conversation in taverns and eventually can retire down and basically become a professional complimenter for some rich lord. Next to the Space Dwarf, this class starts with a laser gun and carbonite mattock and can attack twice per round, one with the laser gun and one with the carbonite mattock. Other than that, they're an interesting take on the dwarf. They get resistance to cold from being in space and once per level, if they get knocked down, they can get back up again at maximum hit points. Ursa feats. So they get one of these at starting at level two and one every even level after that. So there's a list of general feats, clerical feats, fighter, elven, dwarven, halfling feats, magic user, elven feats, thief, halfling feats. You could probably add these to lots of different other OSR classes. So you just need to have a work that out with your party beforehand. Otherwise, I'd use this to acclimatize players who are used to 5th edition to playing in an OSR game, as it does add more mechanics that they are familiar with that otherwise OSR games generally assume you know, the, the DM will rule on, but 5e, they're baked into the classes. So having extra stuff like this to smooth that transition, or just to add more flavor to your OSR games. Spells of the Dead, spells known by the undead, Breath of Death, Dirge, Spectral Fade, Mortiferous Mist, Force Astral Travel. Very unique spells, and if someone does happen to learn them, if they ha aren't dead, then they are affected by the Feeble Mind spell. Adds a bit more flair, mystery, to these spells, consequences should you poke your nose where it shouldn't be. Other spells, find familiar, a familiar first level spell, but with the additional three here, which are cleric spells, such as Schism, the cleric immediately and irrevocably severs all ties with their god. The caster will instantly lose all abilities to cast spells or turn the undead, but may still use magic items usable by clerics. If the caster swears devotion to a new god, all powers will return. If you were trying to change what god you are worshiping, whether through role-playing reasons or, say, you were forced to transfer by changing alignment through deck many things or something like that, then you could use that spell to start that process. Other two, adding to the themes of clerical combat or setting yourself up even as a god. Here we have four separate menus for taverns and inns that have a specific theme. So an elven establishment, a half-orc establishment, a gnome establishment, and a dwarven establishment. Let's just quickly roll up a meal from dwarves. Number three, hard-boiled pseudo-dragon egg wrapped in wild boar sausage, breaded and fried. Three silver pieces. Have a themed menu for each of these restaurants. Adds yeah, a bit more depth to these locations and has the name of the proprietor. So to continue the theme in alternatives, there are 10 in alternatives here that vary from a common adventurous hall to eating inside a fossilized dead creature. So, number two, tea houses. These simple structures are roughly built together but are free to sleep at, provided you buy meals here. They were created long ago to accommodate traders but now serve pilgrims, wanderers, and adventurers. This one has the name of Read the Leaves. Price is free, food is two gold pieces per meal, which usually consists of lentils, potatoes, rice, and fried apples. Locations, middle of nowhere, small towns, middle-sized towns, large towns, cities. So pretty much anywhere. Here we have a range of adventurous packs from the classes earlier in the book, but you could use these for different OSR classes if you felt they're appropriate, or put them up for sale as something in a shop or general store. Again, this and this prior experience is a bit we're about to go through here, uh, could be used to, again, with the f a 5e party that you're bringing into an OSR game. So you start them with a pack here, and then maybe start them with some prior experience. So this backgrounds from 5e brought into, the, into an OSR here. So we'll just roll up one of these as well on d12. 12. Healthy, plus 3 to all saves versus poison. And there's a good variety here. The city NPC generator. This allows you to generate NPCs for eight different wards in the city. And there's five different tables you can roll on for them here. So we will just roll up one quickly now. 1d8, 0. This is a d10, no wonder. 6. 
So in the Palace Ward, so now we'll get the D10. No, we've rolled up Osk, who has plus one int stat modifier. They six are an obelisk builder. Seven, they have high cheekbones. And ten, they carry a flask of eternal youth. Oh my. So they have more intelligence than usual. They carry a flask of eternal youth because they have high cheekbones and they're an obelisk builder. Maybe they're some kind of high priest and they've been controlling the construction of the monuments in this city for years and nobody's quite sure how old they are, how long they've been around. They can carry a flask of eternal youth. So if the players encounter them in some kind of adversarial situation, that's a bit of loot that the players get a hold of from them. Here we have an adventure that takes up the majority of the remainder of the zine. This is it's called Hadrian's Rock, and this is the aforementioned Hadrian. Uh, he is a lich, that is well, a space lich, that was defeated 4,000 years ago and was banished to an asteroid. They have since spent the time building up a whaling, a space whaling outpost. Spoilers ahead. From here, they will try to engage the players in the hunt for the remaining shards of his crystal scepter that will return him to power. He will offer a handsome price for each of these crystal shards. And a party of Prometheans, led by the Broodmother, has a map to these shards and is working against Hadrian to get these shards for themselves to uh, raise up their own their own standing. So there's the Broodmother's compound as she's an important NPC in this adventure setting. And here's some clues for adventure, what a Promethean looks like, familiar now, and Hadrian the Lich. And some uh, extra details of loot from the adventure. And then the final thing here, we have two Dwarven poems. I'm not going to do a dramatic reading of them, but they are entertaining nonetheless. So that is Old School and Cool, an OSR zine. Uh, I like this one a lot. It has quite a nice amount of player-facing content to it, as well as things for DMs to use in the background and an a very nice adventure. A bit more kind of sci-fi fantasy themed here, which is a big part of the OSR scene. So yeah, that's Old School and Cool. Thank you for watching.